Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 to 34. If we can do a quick recap, in chapter 5, it was about the righteousness subjects must possess, subjects of the kingdom of God. And in chapter 6, which we are now in, it is the righteousness that the subjects must practice. So applying what they have learned. So last week, when we started on chapter 6, we did the first 18 verses and they were about the kingdom principles. And now as we come to chapter 19, we have before us the priorities for the kingdom citizens. And essentially, it is about man's duty to God. It is about stewardship and also about spirituality in everyday life. So let's look at this from verse 19 to verse 24. We will be looking at number one, a question of treasure, which is verse 19 to 21. And then verse 22 and 23, it's a question of vision. And verse 24, it is a question of worth. So let's read verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break it and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so if you follow me on the screen, this is where we are. A question of treasures. And Jesus make it so clear as our duty unto the Lord. What we are, who we are, we are stewards. And all that he has placed in our hands. Now, if you look around us, for most people, life is just about acquiring and then protecting all that we have accumulated over the years. But that is not where we are to put our hearts in. So, looking at this, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy. So moth, if I can just highlight um, clothes, clothes. So clothes will be the favorite haunt of the moth. The moth will attack the clothes. And then for possessions, the rust will attack the possessions and destroy them both. Now, in the days of old, they did not have uh, cupboards. They do not have things that will house their items. And so, if they accumulate, the moth and the rust will come and destroy. And also, they, do not have, they did not have banks. They did not have safe deposit boxes. Uh, they did not have vaults to keep their possessions. So, they are very vulnerable to thieves who will break in and steal. If we can look at Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 10, He who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver. Nor he who loves abundance with increase. This also is vanity. So, what else, what then can you do? Should you do? Verse 20, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. What they have been doing all this while is very temporal. Leaving it, leaving them, accumulating them and leaving them on earth. Possessing them on earth. They are very temporal because the moth will, and the rust will destroy. But what Jesus was pointing them to was something eternal. Laying up 
treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in. And just looking at a couple of verses, if you look at uh, Proverbs 23 verse 4, Do not overwork to be rich because of your own understanding. Cease. So cease using your own wisdom in order to enrich yourself. But set your eyes, set your heart, set your mind on things above. So for that we have Colossians chapter 3 verse 2. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth and so often we look at the circumstances we look at the things of the world things that appeal to our eye our flesh and we pursue but the word of god says set your mind on things above and not on things on the earth we can also look at Hebrews, no, sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 onwards. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share and in so doing if they do verse 17 and verse 18 then there is something for them in verse 19 which is they are actually storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life and this is what jesus is emphasizing from verse 20 in verse 20 storing up for yourselves a good foundation for the future where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal and then we have verse 21 and this is so meaningful to me because um, when i was a new believer just after i accepted christ a dear friend of mine from university who was persuading me and always bringing me and inviting me to church. And when he found out that I accepted the Lord Jesus as my Savior, he sent me a t-shirt with this verse 21. For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. So, where, and isn't that true? If your treasure is earthly, your heart will be here. If your treasure is in your business, in your work, in your hobby, your heart will be there. So align your heart rather. So in other words, set your mind on the right things. So where your treasure is, if your, tre if your mind is there, if you have chosen the right treasure, there your heart will be also. So this is a question of treasure. So what is your treasure? Temporal or eternal? Next we have a question of vision. Verse 22 and 23. The lamb of the body is the eye. And if your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? There are two main gateways into us. There is the ear gate where we hear and we listen and it comes into us and it can influence us, impact us. There is also the eye gate what we see because that will also enter into our body so the lamb of the body is the 
I. Therefore, if your I is good, is clear and healthy, then your whole body will be full of light. But if you your eye is bad, if you cast your eyes on the wrong things, then the whole body will be full of darkness. So it is referring to moral, it is referring to moral corruption, nothing else. And this this is something that we ought to be mindful of. Casting your eyes on the right things. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So we look at Proverbs 28 verse 22. A man with an evil eye hastens after riches and does not consider that poverty will come upon him because he is so occupied in his pursuit for wealth, for riches. Now, mind you, there is nothing wrong with possessing treasures, but definitely wrong if the treasures possess you. And if you, you have an evil eye, you are looking at the wrong thing, focusing on the wrong thing, there is moral corruption in you, chances are you'll be pursuing hasten is the word, after riches, and you will not consider that failure will come upon you. You will not consider that there will be bad times. But surely, poverty will come upon him, such a person. So that is a question, a question of vision. And it will determine the quality of inner life that you and I will have. Now we come to verse 24. Verse 24, back to, back to Matthew. Let's see. A question of worth, verse 24. No one can serve two masters. So this serving here is likened to that of a slave. You are serving a master, someone superior to you. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Some simply will say this is money, which is not wrong. It is also something demonic, like an idol. You are pursuing such. So you cannot serve both. Now, if you recall in Psalm 73, which we studied some years back, even the psalmist, supposedly the righteous one, walking right, before God. But even in the flesh, the psalmist almost fell to temptation, almost succumbed to temptation, almost yielded to temptation. Because as he looked around, he saw that the unrighteous were prospering. The right, the, the righteous not so much, but the unrighteous were prospering. And so he was tempted. And so in 73, Psalm, Verse 1, truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. So, verse 1 describes the psalmist, but even him. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, which also describes him. He was pure in heart, but he also stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. In short, it means that the psalmist had to choose, 
had to take sides. Either he is for God or he is not. Either he is for treasures in heaven or he is for treasures on earth. And he can only choose one. He cannot serve two masters. So let's look again at uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. Let's look at verse 10. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness, greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrow. And there is, I mean, if you're after money, there is no shortcut. If you're after money, there is always sweat. And if you're after money, you will be distracted from the things of God. So you would likely stray from the faith in your greediness. And along the way, you will pierce yourself with sorrow. Verse 11, but you, O man of God, but you, Paul was writing to the believer, but you, O man of God, flee these things. In other words, not running to, but running from these things. And if you're running, if you run from these things, unrighteous things, then you must run towards the righteous things. So, and pursue righteousness. Godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. And that is what we all ought to do. For we cannot serve both. So that is verse 24. And we have covered a question of treasure, a question of vision, and a question of worth. And it is most timely that we check ourselves as to what and where our heart is aligned with. Now we go on to verse 25. Therefore, so having position and, and presented to the disciples in verse from verse 19 to 24, therefore, Jesus said, I say to you, do not worry about some of these things of life, what you will where, what you will eat. So you have here. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat, or what you will drink, nor about your body, and what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Now, this question is rhetorical, meaning the answer is obvious. You don't need to answer. The disciples don't need to answer. So, one commentator described worry as strangling yourself. As strangling yourself, you are in anxiety and you're worrying about things that may or may not take place. So, we have worry over, worrying over food, over drink, and about clothing. And what are these? These are material things. And these are things that are so basic. But Jesus said, is not life more than food and the body more than the clothing? Look, and he gave example. Verse 26, Look, look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than them? Simply, Jesus is saying, you look, look at the birds, they are constantly active. Constantly working. But they do not worry. So you ought to go about your daily life as what you have in your vocation or other responsibilities and do not worry. Because having given us His Son, Jesus, 
there are what else will he withhold from us? So if we look at Romans chapter 8, verse 32. Romans chapter 8, verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. And we just celebrated Good Friday yesterday when Jesus went to the cross bearing our sins shedding his blood where at Calvary his love turned red and our sins washed white and all this because God loved the world and he gave his only begotten son he delivered him up for us all how shall he not with him how shall God the Father not with God the Son Jesus also freely underline the word freely freely give us all underline the word all all things now don't be too imaginative you know you want your Ferrari you want your bungalow you want your other material possessions but the context here is what you eat what you drink and what you wear God will give us all things yes we are back so looking at verse 32 sorry verse 25 so do not worry so now we are looking at verse 26 as I mentioned God values us more than the birds surely he will take care of us by worrying it shows a lack of trust in God and verse 27 which of you by worrying can add one cubic to his stature which of you by worrying can add one cubic to his stature now what is the meaning of this that means this is referring to your lifespan. This is referring to your lifespan. By worrying, can you add a year, two years to your lifespan? No, you can't. Because all these are determined by God. But it does show a lack of trust in him by you so if you look at Romans chapter 14 Romans chapter 14 verse 23 Romans chapter 14 verse 23 but he who doubts is condemned now the context here is about food but the application is the same but he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he, would, he, because he does not eat from faith. But I'd like you to look at the last part. For whatever is not from faith is sin. By worrying, you are showing a lack of trust and faith in God. And that is sin. So, if I can put it simply, worrying is disastrous to ourselves disaster to ourselves and it is dishonoring to God and you and I don't want to do that so worry not because you cannot add even a single day more to your lifespan you can't add a cubic to your stature verse 28 so why do you worry about clothing so why do you worry about clothing Consider the lilies. Of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yeah, here we are. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed 
like one of this. If you have been to Europe or even Japan, and you look at the gardens in the right season, I believe it's autumn or spring, and how beautiful the whole array of flowers are, and they're just simply beautiful. And Solomon, King Solomon, in all his richness, he, is, he was the wisest man, at the same time the wealthiest man of his time. And yet with all the wealth, he could not have adorned himself, himself with all this beauty. But God is saying, Now if God so clothes the grass of the field which today is, that means they exist temporally, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven for burning fuel. Will he much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So, material things shouldn't be your life goal. Because God will clothe you with something more, much more than this. And praise be to the Lord, he has clothed us with a robe that is far more beautiful, more glorious than what you see even in the fields. And that is the robe of righteousness. But meanwhile, meanwhile, you can clothe yourself with a warm smile. A warm smile will never run out of fashion. So, smile, show your Colgate teeth. Now, why so? Why so? that he will clothe us much more because we are made in his image. If you look at Galatians, chapter, no, sorry, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle and over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And if God did all this for us, and He said we are very good, surely He will clothe us. And as I just mentioned, we, we are clothed in the robe of righteousness. So have faith. Now we come to verse 31 again. Jesus is saying, therefore, therefore, based on what he just said in the last couple of verses, now in verse 31, he says, therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? You notice the context is all things doesn't mean everything, but the context here is what we eat and what we drink. So verse 31 Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For all these things, for after all these things, the Gentiles seek. But Jesus was addressing his disciples, who are not Gentiles. And even here, we find application because we are not of the world. We are children of God. Believers, followers of Jesus Christ. So, for after all these things, the Gentiles seek. So, we should not be like them. For your heavenly Father knows, of course, He is omniscient, that you need all these things. But, verse 33, we all know it so well. You must have memorized it from the early days of your walk with Jesus. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Seek first. So prioritize, put God first, and then he will put you first. Honor him, and he will honor you. So, verse 33, in essence, is a summary from verse 19 to verse 32. 
a summary of all that Jesus had just taught them. So what is the solution? What is the resolution? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So you seek him and you walk rightly before him. And if you do the first part, the second part is yours. And all these things, basic things, the food, the drink, and the clothes shall be added. That means you have something. And then all this will be added to you. You have the rope of righteousness and all this will be added to you. You have more than just basic. This is, let's say, uh, we look at now, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. Just a simple verse. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. Do you know this is a struggle even amongst believers? Godliness, yes. Hallelujah, they come to church, they praise the Lord, they worship, they read the Bible. But contentment, not many can settle for what has been placed in their hands by the Lord. They want more. They want another property. They want uh, another possession. They, they just want more. It is never, it is nev they are never satisfied. But learning to be contented, I believe, is key to our spiritual growth. Some are given five talents. Some are given two talents. Some are given one talent. If you are given one, be contented. If you are given two, praise the Lord, be contented. If you are given five, go forth and multiply and be contented. So that is a challenge for us. Godliness with contentment is great gain. And still here, let's look at chapter 4, verse 8. Paul also wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, for bodily exercise profits a little. This is to build up your earthly body. This that came from dust, which will eventually go back to dust. Meanwhile, you want to pump iron and you want to convert your, 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 your body tissues into muscles. But it profits a little because the day will come when they will return to fat. And the day you expire, it will go back to dust. Bodily exercise profits a little, it's temporal, but godliness, the things of God, do, doing the things of God, pleasing Him, is profitable for all things. This is permanent, this is eternal, doing things, aligning yourself in the will of God and doing things according to His will for Him, for His glory. It is profitable for all things. Having the promise of life that is now. So you will get your blessings now and of that which is to come and in the future as well. So it's not just blessings for the future, but now and also the future. And so godliness, if I can use it, pays. There are rewards for godliness. So back to Matthew chapter 6. Now we go on to verse 34. Therefore, therefore again, highlighting what the summary is after we have studied the last 33 verses. Therefore, do not worry. So if there is anything else you can learn, from verse 19 until here. Just three words. Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So every day has its challenge. Every day has got its uh, troubles. So live for the day. Don't worry. As a singer once 
pen this song. Don't worry, be happy. So before we leave this, let me turn you to Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. We all know this, I'm sure. Be anxious for nothing. That means do not worry. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Thanking God for everything we have. If you think you are bad, there are others who are worse than you. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, not men. And the peace of God. So if you do the first part, and then the peace of God will come to you, will guard your hearts. But this peace, you must note this, which surpasses all understanding. So in other words, sometimes you have the peace in your heart, but with your eyes you see a different situation, and you do not understand how God can turn things around, nor achieve what you desire. Or, do, or he does not do what you desire. He does something else. Or he does nothing. You do not understand. Because the peace of God will go past your understanding. But this peace of God will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So what it remains for you to do is just to place your trust and your faith in him. For he will work all things for the good of those who love him who are called according to his will. So, as we end this, I've just got a couple of uh, additional slides that I want to show to you. I just put together some of these power phrases, so they call it. They are not from the Bible, but nonetheless, uh, they can encourage you, even in this time, as we go through this crisis, uh, COVID, coronavirus, and we are being so-called locked down. And you are worried about toilet paper, whether you have enough rice, whether you still have your job, your kids, whether the education, home-based education is sufficient, they cannot connect with the teachers. Well, the service of mammon always involves us in anxiety. Anything, in fact, everything in life is almost, almost everything is directly or indirectly related to money. Don't study hard, can't get a good degree, cannot get a job, cannot get the kind of income you want. So, there is anxiety. The service of mammon always involves us in anxiety. All anxiety is in itself a service of Mammon. Worry, as I mentioned earlier, disastrous to ourselves and dishonoring to God. It is a disabling faith. Your faith will pause, will stutter, and some people can't get back up. So don't. Worry never satisfies our need and always destroys our peace. How true. Worry does not remove the sorrows of tomorrow but remove the joys of today. What can we do about tomorrow? We don't even know. The weatherman is never accurate. He may say it will shine, but it may pour. Who knows? But live for today. Celebrate and enjoy and be joyful today. Today is the tomorrow we worried about yesterday. Is that not true? And come tomorrow, you do the same thing. So, Cease. Do not do likewise. So what is a prescription? Three things. From all that we have studied from verse 19 to 34. Don't worry about anything. Pray for everything. And give thanks for all things. Remember that these are the three simple applications for, for us today from this section that we have studied. Don't worry about, every, about anything. Pray for everything. Give thanks for all things. Lastly, why we should not worry. As we wrap up this chapter 6, God cares about us. He does. 
So by wording, it is W-O-T, waste of time. It is contrary to faith, which we read just now, Romans chapter 14, verse 23, the last part. Whatever is not of faith is sin. And we just read, God knows our needs in verse 32 of chapter 6. God knows. He is omniscient. He is our Elohim. He is our creator. He makes us. Amen.